Thank you very much. Okay, it's great to be back in Kentucky. One of my favorite states. Y'all have won two out of the last five states of the year. Each year we rank um, states in the South. I only cover the South. If it's not a Southern deal, it's a bad deal. Um, I only cover the South. In fact, I can't go across the Mason-Dixon line, which is right here for fear of assassination. Um, and so I love Kentucky. I've traveled it extensively. In fact, I was talking to some folks over there from uh, where Tom Harned is the economic developer, the aluminum plant there. <clears throat> But before I start, <clears throat> I wrote a book back in 1994 called You Might Be a Southern Economic Developer If. How many economic developers do we have here? <clears throat> well, maybe y'all want, want uh, we got one. Maybe y'all won't understand this. You might be a Southern economic developer if your four-year-old daughter tells her kindergarten classmates that you make your living driving around the woods with the mayor and one other man. <laughs> Do y'all get that? You inform your family that you're taking a new job in an adjoining state and they ask if they can ride in the house during the move like the last time. Prospect from New York asks, what about the schools? Are there any? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Those are our products. Um, I've been in, I've owned media since I was 24 years old. And I started out with the Birmingham Business Journal. <clears throat> now I have national media. We're read all over the world. RandallReport.com is really a cool website. We have two editors that work each day, <clears throat> and they aggregate news from over 300 different uh, websites or media properties throughout the South, from El Paso all the way up to DC. In fact, they post a story from these different media properties every five minutes from nine to five central time. So there's a new story every five minutes. And it's not automated. These two editors, they, they take a shift break right after lunch, choose these stories themselves. I mean, it's like hair on fire kind of work. So if you want to get the top 10 stories from economic development in the South every day, go to randreport.com, scroll down to the bottom, put your email in, email address in, and every morning you'll get the top 10 economic development stories for that day in real time. It's really a cool website. I mean, we have thousands of people who are on that site every day. Um, SB-D.com is the magazine's website. And I'll say something about Kentucky. In 2010, I noticed something about this state, about the Commonwealth. You guys were the first state to break out of the automotive crash, if you will, in 2010. I was on CNBC with our current um, Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross. I know Wilbur. I know him very well. He hates the South. He's from New Jersey. OK? And he is envious of the Southern Auto Corridor's success. The Southern Auto Corridor, and that's the last site up there, 
it's amazing the growth that we've had in the South. And the spine of the Southern Auto Quarter is I-65, which runs right through your state. It runs from Mobile all the way up to um, lesser states like Indiana. <laughs> or Michigan. Or any other state outside the South. Um, so, in 2010, I started seeing all these deals coming out of Kentucky that were automotive. And since I own an automotive, we came up with the, the name, the Southern Auto Quarter. And since I own that, I was very interested to see that Kentucky was the very first state to start announcing deals one after another when we came out of the Great Recession. And it was really awesome to see. You know, automotive and financial services, they tell you what the economy is about. All right, let's get to how I view the economy. I speak with a lot of economists, namely Raphael Bostic, the uh, Atlanta Fed chair, Mark Vittner, the uh, senior economist out of Wells Fargo. Um, but I don't view the, economy, uh, the economy like an economist. They look at real-time data. Um, unemployment rate, productivity rate, you know, whatever. I don't look at it that way. My whole view on the economy is based on projects, project announcements. Um, we have a threshold where if you have a company that announces 200 jobs or more, or 30 million or more in investment, we count it. We've been counting it since 1992. Look at the board there. Through the 60s, 70s, 80s, the South has always been a manufacturing region. Why? It's the cheapest place in the largest economy in the world to make something. You can see from 92 to 95, manufacturing is on the left, services on the right, total deals on the on far right, that manufacturing led services in terms of deals of 200 jobs or more. Why do we do 200 jobs or more? Well, if we went to five jobs, there's no way we could cover it. Okay, I mean, it's stupid to give a headline for something's five jobs. It may be important to you, Okay, but as a media property, we can't, we don't have the resources to cover every single deal. So if you look at the chart, something happened in 1996. For the first time in the South's history, services beat manufacturing in deals of 200 jobs or more. That was the first year where it was a herd mentality to move your company, whether it's south or anywhere, to China, Mexico. That's really when NAFTA really kicked in. We were not competitive. Look at the next few years. 97, 229 manufacturing deals to 407 for the south. You have to understand, this is when the internet was first going on. And, you know, job generation was coming from the service sector, and manufacturing had basically just collapsed completely. Look at the other years. Services are just killing manufacturing. Um, 
That was a sad time. It really was. It, it was. it was a time when we knew from the president to whoever was in office, we knew that we could not compete with China. And the, the number of deals coming from the manufacturing sector definitely show, showed that. Now look at from 2005 to 2018. In 2006, something happened. We freaked out at the office. Manufacturing beat services 257 deals to 225. Nobody even noticed that but us. Of course, we're the only ones tracking deals in the South, so it would only be us. But look at the years after that. Look at the collapse of 2008. It wasn't manufacturing that collapsed in the Great Recession. It was services. Look at 2008, 291 to 138 in terms of deals of 200 jobs or more. But look from 2010, when we got out of the re Great Recession, look at the manufacturing side. We're killing services. In terms of total deals, this economy, and this is not political, I just work with data. And you know, I got, I got folks from the far right, far left, whatever, that, that comment on my data and think it's political. We're just counting this shit. I mean, there's nothing political about it. OK? I mean, it's a friggin' calculator. Look at 2015, 730 projects meeting or exceeding our thresholds. That's when this recovery, and it's 10 years now, 10 years this month, that's when this recovery peaked in terms of how I look at the economy. I only look at project activity. Why? Do you think Toyota, okay, here in Kentucky, doesn't have a good economist figuring out, hey, what's the economy going to do two years from now? The economists for people like, for companies like Toyota, they can see around corners. So if there's lots of projects in a certain year, they know those projects take anywhere from two to three years. You know, if it's a financial services uh, deal, maybe six months, but a big expansion of y'all's Toyota plant in Georgetown, well, that may take two or three years. So these dudes know, these dudettes know. They know what's going to happen two, three years from now. So if you look at 2015, we peaked in this expansion in 2015 and 2016. Look at, but still, if you look at the columns, manufacturers are just beating up services to death. We had 596 deals meeting or exceeding our thresholds last year. That's way down from 730 in 2015. It's not crash and burn numbers. I mean, if you look at 2009 with 368, that's crash and burn numbers. But this is the fourth year, let's see, one, two, three, four. Fourth year in a row, project activity in the South has dropped. We like to, what we do is we, we, we do the sectors each year, and if you look at automotive, it, number three, 
We had 111 automotive, and you know, automotive in this stage, huge. If you look at automotive, we had 111 deals in 2015 and 51 last year. There are two things that are the canary in the coal mine. That's automotive and fi financial services. When there's less money on the street, meaning disposable income, financial services and automotive are the first two industries that are affected in terms of deals. You can see financial services has crashed and burned. Automotive has been cut in half. But distribution has taken over as the deal king in the South, which means all of y'all are just spending so much money on Amazon Prime, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and you got a new Amazon Prime. Wasn't Bezos here just a couple months ago to break ground in, at the Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky airport? But you can see some of the projects from different... Uh, aerospace and aviation has done great. This is a great aviation aerospace state. It's done great for many years. But those are your deals since 2013 based on industry sectors. Here are the top 10 economies in the world with U.S. regions factored in based on GDP. Is there anybody that thinks that China's the largest economy in the world? It's not. It's not even close. We kicked their ass. Look at the South. 6.8 trillion. When I was born, the South, the Northeast, the Midwest all had about the same population, between 54 and 56 million. Today, 10 years later, <laughs> the South has 128 million people. The Midwest has 61 million people. The Northeast has 63 million people. So we are hip deep. We're ear deep in Yankees. <laughs> They've all moved down here. Okay, we have the population of the Midwest and the Northeast combined. Okay, so anytime you hear, there was a story in the Wall Street Journal here recently, you know, condemning the South economy, that's all bullshit. Okay, we are the strongest economy in the world. Look at that. Our economy is larger than Japan's, Germany's economy. I mean, that's incredible. Okay, we didn't have anything 100 years ago. Nothing. And one of the reasons why our economy is so special is we've got something the rest of the country doesn't have. We have major, major markets, not mega markets like Chicago, New York, Los Angeles. We have major, major markets. We have our mega, mega markets. We've got Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, Miami, Northern Virginia. But we've got a slew of major markets, Charlotte, Jacksonville, Birmingham, Nashville. I mean, name another, Austin, Raleigh. Name another city that has a great economy in Illinois. It's just Chicago. Name another great economy for a city or an MSA in New York. They're not there. We have a slew 
of mid-majors all over the South, New Orleans, Nashville, Memphis. They're all over the place. That's why our economy has been so strong is because just about, I think it's going to be maybe 20 or 30 years before every Yankee in the world moves to the South. <laughs> okay, well, you know, the, the goal of any economy is to get to full employment. We're there. In fact, we're beyond full em employment. I mean, we've got people that are working that don't even want to work. There's the uh, situation. We're about 3.6%. We have the longest consecutive monthly job gains in U.S. history. We just last month tied, and now into this month, the longest recovery period in GDP growth, and that beat the 90s. And this is pretty good. I mean, what we're seeing right now in terms of numbers, I mean, hardly anybody can hire anybody because there's no jobs, there are no people left. We're not in, you know, you've been hearing all this stuff about skills gap and all that crap. We're in a body gap. Everybody that has skills has a job. We don't have enough bodies. I mean, think about it. We've had over 7 million jobs available for, what, five years? And we're cutting that down by 100 to 200,000 a month? Something is wrong. It's called we're running out of labor. <clears throat> for decades, after World War II, we could count on 200,000 people a month turning working age, which is 16 years old. 200,000 a month. Through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s. That has dropped to 71,000 people entering the workforce. In you know a couple of years ago, three years ago, it's about to go down to fifty thousand. How many millennials we, do we have in here? One. Get get to work, man. What are you doing here? I mean, you need to be in at the, your house with your husband or partner. Anyway, so. The projected average number of people entering the workforce right now is 50,000. So nobody's having children. Why? They don't think they can afford it. We have five kids. Our youngest, who's 22, just had her first child. That's our first grandchild. The other four don't think they can afford it even though I pay for all their mortgages and everything. I don't... <laughs> okay, so look at that graph right there. If we got 50,000 people coming into the workforce, but yet we've averaged 185,000 new jobs a month, that doesn't compute. I mean, there's no way. So you can forget the 300,000 jobs a month under Obama and 300,000 jobs a month under Trump that's happened a few times. Those days are over. We don't have the people. In other words, 30,000 to 75,000 jobs per month is what you should be looking for. We had 200, what do we have, 200? Last month, and was it 35 the month before? You're going to see that kind of stuff happen. 
go from 200,000 to 30 to 200,000 to 30, 100 to 30. That's where we're headed. But 95 million Americans are outside the workforce. That was told by many politicos, including our president. Total bullshit. Here's what the people outside the workforce are doing. You got family caretakers, 13 million. Disabled, 15 million. Remember, okay, the Commerce Department census everybody counts any worker age 16 to 64 and if they're employed or not. So they even count the dude that has failed the ninth grade four times, okay? He's still in the ninth grade. He drives a Camaro to junior high, <laughs> okay? I mean, think about that. They count him. I mean, he's got a beard and he's in the ninth grade. College students, 20 million. Retirees, that, that figure really <clears throat> stunned me that there's 44 million retirees under 60, 64 years old or less. Or, there's 44 million people. And my father-in-law retired at 38. Okay, you would not believe how many people under 64 are retired. Drug addicted, mentally ill, you can't put them in a category. How many are there? It's got to be in the millions. I mean, they can't get a job. They can't pass a drug test. So we've got no one left. Look at that total. 93 million out of 95 million that are outside the workforce have a reason not to look for a job. So we're in trouble. But we're not, it's not unlike other developed nations. You know, Japan had their lost decade in the 90s. The reason why is they ran out of labor. They came up with an ingenious program, and we should do the same. <clears throat> because if you can't replace your workforce that's out there now, how many baby boomers are here? Okay, yeah, there's a lot of them. If you can't replace, what, we got one millennial and a hundred baby. There's your problem right there. <laughs> you know, if you can't replace your, your workforce, you are a dying nation. Okay? We're just not having enough babies. Again, the drug addicted, mentally ill. Who knows how many that is? Oh, but there's so many people on the government's dime. You know, they just want to get paid by the government. Again, that's flawed. The highest worker participation rate in the nation's history was 1999, 67%. The lowest was 1970. We're at Right now, 62.8%. That's about average in history. That's about average. So what do we do with no, no labor left? We can accept slow, slower growth, because that's all that's going to happen if we don't do anything. You can't have economic growth with nobody 
able to fill the jobs of the workers that are working out or aging out of the labor shed. Again, I told you about Japan. They did a great thing with China where they, they called it internship. They bring in uh, five million workers a year. They can work in Japan for five years. Then they got to go back. After five years, they get another five million. That has sustained their economy. Japan's economy right now is, is just killing it. We can subsidize fertility, pay people to have babies. Right now, I think you get a $2,000 uh, tax credit, make that 10. Kind of expensive, but I mean, again, none of this is political. I just count the numbers. Subsidizing fertility, we only have one millennial here. <laughs> All right, so if you got 10,000 to have a baby, would that motivate you? <laughs> so 2,000, 10,000. Or we can do this, exactly what Japan did. Embrace immigration. Oh my God, immigration. That's so political. It's not. It's just math. It's just math. We get about, last year we had 903,000 legal immigrants come to this country. We've averaged about 1.1 million, 1 .1 million over the last 10 years. That needs to be tripled to 3 million. Legal immigrants. Okay? And as for the illegal immigrants, we need to build that wall to keep them in this country. <laughs> that way they can't go back home. Okay. You know, Paul Ryan, I respected Paul Ryan. I did. He was kind of that centrist, you know, red that kind of had some blue in him. He knew the data. This is his last statement in the media before he um, left office. This is going to be the new economic challenge for America. People. We need to have higher birth rates in this country. We need more people to add to the workforce. Again, we have seven something million jobs available. Think about if those seven million jobs could be filled. What would our economy be like? It'd be off the charts. So we need more people. The only way to do it, all right, is accept slower growth, if you're not going to add people, pay people to have babies, or accept or embrace legal immigration. That's our three choices. It has nothing to do with anything else. It's just math. So we're in a baby bust. That's the problem. We had the lowest fertility rate in history of our country last year and the year before. In fact, 2018 beat 2017 in terms of the lowest. So you can't find labor, skilled labor. Screw the skilled labor. All the people with skills, they have jobs. This is the crisis that's coming. It's the lack of unskilled labor. That's the crisis. I mean, who's going to change your bedpan? Do you know? There's an enormous need 
for low-skilled labor in this country. At this rate, you know, I'm staying in the hotel here. I'll be making up my own bed when I leave. I'm serious. The, the, especially on the personal care and health care um, options. That's the new crisis, is unskilled labor. Especially if we mass deport people that have jobs that are not citizens, but have been living here for years. I mean, are they contributing? They have jobs. Of course they're contributing. But if we start mass deporting people who have been living here for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're not citizens, how do you think that's going to work with the economy? Because we have nobody else to hire. How is this hotel going to find the workers if 40 of them are deported tomorrow? They're not. Okay, so we maybe have a, a sweet ending to our workforce problems. Nobody has a handle on what automation and AI and robotics will do to the economy. I mean, just about everything you read is speculation. But we've lost five million already and that automation is happening every day. Some have said that 40% of the current jobs will be lost to automation by 2040. If that's the case, it will free up the labor that we need. But again, nobody has a real grasp on that. Okay, let's talk about, and I'm about to end this, let's talk about uh, one thing. Trump's tariffs. And when I say Trump's tariffs, usually the Congress will set tariffs and other trade uh, legislation. This is the first time in this country's history that an executive order by the president created tariffs or protectionism policies. First time in the nation's history, one person did that. Okay, again, that's not political. I'm not anti-Trump, I'm not anti-anything. It's just friggin' data. Look at what China did in 2016 in terms of investments in the United States. These were greenfield deals. Didn't y'all have a Chinese deal that, that backed out here in Kentucky? Anyway, we had $46 billion in new Chinese investment in 2016. Look at what we ha had in 2018. Look. Tariffs are good for one thing. Tariffs do this and this only. Less is sold. What is sold costs more. That's it. The Chinese aren't paying these tariffs. The people that are are getting these imports, the companies that are getting these imports, they're the ones paying the tariffs. Then they hike the cost of what you buy, so eventually you're paying the tariffs. If we go through with the 232 tariff thingies that Trump wants to do with automotive, we'll be in recession in 12 months. We might be in recession in nine months, given what the tariffs 
have done already. So I, I don't get the tariffs at all. I don't know why we're even doing them. I mean, does anybody know? It doesn't make any sense. All right, let's see if I got anything else. If you would like to get the magazine, and we practice something that hardly anybody does anymore, it's called journalism. <laughs> if you want to get the magazine, okay, come up here and get your picture taken, and um, I'll put you on the main list for free, and you can get it. I'm out of time. Thank you all very much. Don't go anywhere. Maybe one question. If a person has one burning question, we'll take that before we move on to the next part of our program. Please go to the mic so we can hear you, please. Whoever gets there first. They don't have to be fast. It has to be faster than the other person. <laughs> okay, make it, please, very quick. Yes. The question is, if we have less labor, why is it we have not seen wage pressure at, to create inflation and good, increase pay? Good question. Um, the Great Recession was the perfect excuse for companies to cut labor costs. I mean, we're running out of business. We're going out of business. Uh, that's still carrying over today. Any Very other? Good. good, succinct question and answer. Thank you. Mike Randall, give Thank him a round of applause. Get your picture taken with him before he leaves town. Thank you so much for that very colorful presentation.